Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. It's getting close, boys. To what? What do you think? Just get, just take a guess. Evan. Death? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> every every day a step closer. That's why this episode. That's why this podcast is so consistent. It's just a benchmark for Evan and his mortality. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, getting closer to the NHL draft. Quite the opposite, philosophically speaking, in terms of NHL careers. So, uh, hate to burst your morbid bubble there. My NHL career is that what you're talking about? <laughs> no, but yours. I'm sorry to say, it, yours is long gone. Yes, it's yeah, very much past. Are you sure you're okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Why? You did say you didn't golf all weekend, and you've said four words since you came into the house. I practiced on Friday, I guess. Oh Maybe God, does that guy, count? This guy practices. Jeez. Yeah, the NHL draft. We are, what is it, four, 11 days away? We're getting there. We're running out of episodes. Really only 11 days? Yeah, we're running out of episodes before the official Winged Wheel Podcast NHL draft preview episode comes. Our final mock draft is going to come. So, And I feel like we are still, and this is fun. There's still just as big of a cloud of obfuscation over who the Red Wings might pick at eighth overall. Or we keep saying that, so they're definitely going to trade the pick. This has been the biggest group of players oh, yeah. that has been tied to the Red Wings. Like, obviously, when the Wings went out way off the board and took Cider, nobody could predict that. But going in, like, most pundits and analysts and scouts had it narrowed down to a group of about four or five players that the Red Wings at least should have been considering in that range. Um, the Rasmussen year was not much bigger. Raymond's was even less. This one, like, again, I know I briefly mentioned it last episode. It, it could legitimately be about 14 to 15 players. You know, we're doing our best here to talk, like highlight the most, the players yeah. who are a balance of most likely in players that we want, just to give you a healthy mix of both those sides of the coin. But we're not exaggerating when we say, Think of a guy who, Brad, for example, you have ranked in your 20s, very well could come up here for the Red Wings. We might be, you know, we're not going to double back on Daniela Yurov. He could be the pick for Detroit. I honestly would not be incredibly shocked. Matejcha, Korchinski, Minshikov, Casper, um, Pickering. God, I'm free. And I'm uh, geeky. Lambert. Like, there's so much. Yeah, there's so much there. It's full silly season, and I love it. If anyone, if you've ever seen like a ranking where you're like, oh, there's this random, like a ranking that has Osland top 15 or like at eighth overall, not insane to think. Sure. Like, it yeah. honestly could plausibly sure. happen. The amount of information. Well, both those guys specifically are Swedish, so that gives them a 20% bump. Yeah. When it yeah. comes to a Red Wings. Ongren and Osland. Yeah. Yeah. So there's the only information that I've been able to glean from this draft, and I think we all do, is like, how the Red Wings feel positively about one player or another. Very little of that, but not like they're ruling one player out or anything else. So it's going to be fun. Strap in. Welcome to the Winged Wheel, Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk to you uh, all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the NHL draft, the Stanley Cup playoffs, and the world of hockey. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. You said it so quietly last episode that we were accused of you not saying it. And I had to explain to people that you mumble into your microphone because you hate me as a person. <laughs> that was Wednesday, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Why? What was Wednesday? I was golfing and then I had to come here. <laughs> Did you even have to ask? I don't know why I do it. I'm a glutton <laughs> for punishment. Uh, on this episode of the Wind Wheel Podcast, we'll be talking about the new E60 uh, Unrivaled documentary that just premiered today. Uh, some fans at the LCA were able to see the uh, an early release on Saturday, which I was fortunate enough to attend. Uh, some news on Barry Trotz. He's out of the mix. We'll talk about that and what that means for the Red Wings, as well as uh, maybe a refresh on some coaching options. And then we are going to do the big one for this episode, which is a revisit of Matthew Savoy uh, as a possible prospect for the Red Wings to draft at eighth overall. Where are we on him? Where's the league on him? Could he be a center? Should that matter? All those fun questions. Uh, we'll be taking a look at news from across the NHL, including where the Stanley Cup playoffs are at. And game six is to be played shortly. As of right now, we're recording about uh, an hour and a half before game six starts. So um, we always tend to do that. eh? It always tends to, to line up with the episodes, but it's good fun. 
No, not this cup final. It's not. You don't, Do you know what? This cup final has probably pissed me off more than any other cup final because I hate both teams, and this has probably been the highest quality of hockey we've seen in a cup final since the Wings Pens. Game five was phenomenal. It's been absolutely incredible hockey. I was thinking about that on the drive over. Like this isn't like a, um, you know, where Nashville makes it all the way to the finals and gets thumped, or New Jersey makes it all the way to the finals and gets thumped, like we've seen in years past, like Montreal. Yeah, like these are two. Like Tampa Bay, are they coming off of their their high? Like the uh, the dynasty is finally starting to at least dip for a little bit. And Colorado putting together the best team they've had in twenty years, it is amazing hockey to the point where the margins matter. Like a ten feet of difference on the ice was that too many men is what people are actually losing their minds over one way or another. So yeah, it, it's been great hockey. And bonus, Brad's pissed off, so yeah, everyone's happy. Yeah. Yeah, there's been a bunch of good finals in the la- since the Red Wings pens, but not to this level. Before we get into it, um, I want to thank everyone again. The uh, Wings Money on the Board campaign passed the thirty-one thousand dollar mark for the uh, this season uh, in our fundraising goal for the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So thank you all very much for that. The giveaways uh, and everything to wrap up that season are coming shortly. So stay tuned. Uh, visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org to find out more about the great work that they're doing uh, and how you can help support. And shout out to all of you who donated through Wings Money on the Board. And of course, uh, our partner uh, in setting up this campaign, Prashant Iyer, to, uh in doing so. Man, the... Red Wings Colorado rivalry is one of the most documented, well storied, well known, it's practically gospel at this point sagas in NHL history and even sports history. And and if you're a new Red Wings fan and you don't know about it, the E60 documentary is a great way to to get into it. But honestly, if you're a Red Wings fan and you're listening to this and you're saying, "Yeah, I know all about it," Ryan's right, which you should never say. Um, this documentary still brought a whole new layer, a whole new level of everything to the whole story. Halfway through, I was like, I was in my seat in the LCA watching. They, they, good job on the Red Wings for, they dropped the uh, the Jumbotron and we all sat in the lower bowl. And there was quite a few people there. I'd say three, 4,000 maybe. I'm terrible mm-hmm. at like estimating, but there was quite a few people. And uh, everyone was watching. People were amped up. They were cheering like Vladdy was throwing a hit live on the ice in front of them. And I, I was ready to run through a wall. And then obviously they got to the part about, you know, the, the limo accident and everything. And I was like gripping Mel's arm, like ready to sob. And then the interview with Vladdy came up like today, like it's not old. They did it for this documentary and I was ready to run through a wall for Vladdy. Like the stories that came up, uh, Darren McCarty and Claude Lemieux did like a sit down with the crowd and like a, what looked like a bar. And it was you know, it is your sworn duty as a Red Wings fan to hate Claude Lemieux. But I will concede it was really, really, really interesting to hear him talk about it with Darren next to him about the whole incident and, and just talking openly. He's like, yeah, here's where I just get absolutely dummy. <laughs> like, <laughs> it is. It was surreal. I never thought I was going into it expecting to enjoy it because, I, you know, you know the story and it's a great story. Most parts of it, some parts are tragic, of course, but... Yeah, coming out of that, I was like, wow, I, I I now have a deeper appreciation for something that I already truly loved in that story. The ending, though. There's there's two parts of the ending, which I won't spoil for people, but you know, it's you see Darren and you see Claude, and they've made amends and they're good now. Like Darren calls him his friend. And Chris Draper, not quite there. Not angry, but very much. You know, he's doing his thing and not very keen on the uh, the uh, building a friendship route, which I honestly, I, I kind of liked. Don't blame a- him. AGM no. sometimes do uh, contract negotiations. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. About. And uh, who's Mo Sider's <laughs> agent again? We've talked about this for a couple episodes now. <laughs> Claude Lemieux is Mo Sider's agent. And I know a lot of people might not like that, but there's no indication that that's changing anytime soon. I'm pretty sure... Uh, m- Sider thanked his agency in his Calder acceptance speech, and he's going to have a contract negotiation coming up. So you don't know who's going to be in the room. Sometimes they send the AGM. Sometimes it's the whole brass. And even, you know, the agent themselves doesn't always do every bit of negotiation. So it might not be Stevie Draper or Lemieux in the room for all of it, but 
but it's man, still a funny dynamic. If you had to be on the a fly on the wall for one conversation, I would I would one hundred percent pick that contract negotiation. <laughs> it's good stuff. Uh, e sixty unrivaled. Um, if e- premiered today on ESPN and then ESPN Plus after, um, and then we'll try to get more information on, on how those of you from across the world uh, can watch it as well. So, uh, really worth the watch. And man. It's been 25 years, and I still like it's the the story. oh since the fight night at the gym like yeah, yeah rivalry is yeah. a last out a little longer than that well yeah just like a, a little bit longer at, at least that's what they zeroed in on and it's 25 years later that story still grips me like oh yeah yeah uh, and to all of you who were at the LCA and said hi uh, much appreciated and uh, it was always good to see fans it made me excited for the next meetup now to some bummer news. For some, maybe some of you will be happy about this. Barry Trotz, off the market. Never really seemed like he was close to Detroit. The name came up a few times, but more or less he was informing Winnipeg that he wasn't going to be coaching this year. So that's his decision as of right now. Wanted to take time. Spent time with with family. Seemed like he wasn't 100% into it and uh, said he needed to, you know, you go, go, go as a coach for decades. You need to take the time to do the things you need to do with your family and your personal life. So... You respect it, but um, that's a big name off the board for the Red Wings. Probably didn't like any of the teams that were looking for a coach. If he wants to compete now, Winnipeg has some shit going on. Like, that team's in disarray. Pierre-Luc Dubois has pretty much already said that he's going to test the market when he's a free agent, and that's not even next season. Yeah, two years out. Uh, And Blake Wheeler. is on the trade market. And probably uh, Mark Scheifele, based on that end of season press conference, where he said he doesn't know what his role in the team is anymore. And if those guys go, what's going to happen to Hellebuck? Yeah, if you're Trots, why are you going to get on another ship where you're like, are you leaning up or are you just did you break in half and now you're sinking, right? So, and then with Detroit, you know, let's say he was ever serious about Detroit, which we don't know, he could look at that team and say, yeah, you have Raymond, you have Sider, you have Lorcan, you have Bertuzzi. Edmondson's coming in, but you're no Colorado, you're no Tampa Bay. Are you going to be competing for a cup this Who's season? in your division? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to be competing for a cup next season? No. It's uh, unfortunate, but the statistics, the odds, just by sheer numbers, make all things equal. The Red Wings were never heavy favorites coming into the Trots conversation. So where does that leave us, in your opinion? Pretty much where we expected to be. That's my honest answer. I I always felt like the most likely option Detroit was going to go was going to be with a more inexperienced but well-respected coach. I didn't get the impression that a retread was going to be the likely option unless it was the caliber of a Trotz or a um, Cassidy. Um, one of yeah. the, like one of the candidates that was so obviously good that you had to, but you know, Stevie with all his Tampa connections and all the rumors about the Tampa assistant coaches and Benoit grew and, you know, Stevie casting such a wide net means he's going to interview far more non retreads and retreads. Um, I, I think we're about right where I expected to be. I think the only thing that trots changed Two things I should say uh, have probably hindered Stevie here. Trotz dragging it out for as long as he did obviously held things up. And Tampa going on such a long run, I think, also is holding things up longer than yeah. Stevie would have liked. So uh, I'm going to point people to a couple articles in case you want to read deeper about the potential coaches. First, um, the If I Were Steve Eisenman series uh, that Prashanth Iyer has been writing Um Three parts are up and part two covers coaches. It's on the wingedwheelpodcast.com blog. Uh, I'll link it in the description of the episode. Um, and then also Max recently wrote for the Athletic Detroit um, a resetting the Red Wings coaching search after a flurry of hires piece, which is <laughs> the Barry Trotz is the last one listed. So just stop reading there or read the whole thing. It's Max's work. Um, but it's a good kind of refresh of where we're at. So there's something that was noted in there because you mentioned the assistants, Brad, um, which are Derek Lalonde and Jeff Halpern with the Tampa Bay Lightning. And those are pretty prominent names. I don't want to call them likely because no one can say that for sure. But Benoit Gru is also there, right? And he's head coach of the Syracuse, Syracuse Crunch. They're not in right now. And uh, they could have already made the decision. 
And it gives you a moment of pause and you're like, well, if it was going to be Benoit Gru, why didn't they already hire him? But like you just said, Brad, Trotz could have been the stopgap. If Eisenman was gung-ho on Trotz and said, this guy is so good, I'm willing to like wait on everything. A hypothetical scenario here is that he's ready to go on someone like Benoit Gru. He's ready to go on someone overseas or he's ready to go on, you know, maybe uh, Warsawski is a name that Max noted. Like that's... um that is now a potential option now that Trotz is out of the way. Was Trotz a stopgap holding everything else up? I would put that at less likely than he's waiting for the Stanley Cup final to be over to either talk to or confirm one of the Tampa Bay assistants. But it's uh, whether you're pro bringing Trotz in or you're, you know, you're anti bringing Trotz in, no matter what, this will now move the process along, which I think we can appreciate. Yeah, and what did Stevie really miss out on here by waiting? I would argue not much because outside of Cassidy to Vegas and Luke Richardson to the Hawks, every other coaching hire has been, for lack of a better term, a rehire of one of the same 32 mediocre coaches that seems to recycle themselves through the league every few years. Would Paul Maurice have been an option? Yeah, that would have been all right. Would uh, Tortorella have been an option? Yeah, sure. Would have been all right, but would DeBoer have been an option? Yeah, sure, it would have been all right. But the, he didn't miss out on anything that I, I would have classified as one of the better options for Detroit outside of maybe Cassidy, but I don't think Cassidy would have ever. With Vegas and some of those other teams available, I wouldn't have ever called that likely either, Um, just like Trot. So I think Stevie waited out the market, didn't really lose anything by it, and was – one of the final few people, at least at the table with Trotz before he made his decision. Yeah. The point with Cassidy is like, if you're going to go anywhere and you choose Vegas, that means Detroit wasn't in the mix. Yeah. Like that's not chocolate versus vanilla ice cream. That's like chocolate ice cream versus, I don't know, a different dessert. Terror. That's Ryan's terrible <laughs> analogy for the day. Uh, yes. I understand completely. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of get your attention, get the brain churning. So what I mean, say about talking about food before the episode two. Oh, yeah. You know, I messed up on a couple fronts here. You bastard. You, you, did, <laughs> you did tell me that you sat in the car for 10 minutes waiting for the rain to stop. You could have came in and snacked. I could have. Um, I'm already really soaked as it is. It, any worse, any more would have been way worse. I didn't want to tell you, but you stink. I'm not surprised. Um, That's just what Abby rubbed off on me. Yes, she was thrilled to see you. And then in your opinion, you know, reading what Max wrote about Warsawski and knowing the Chicago Wolves, you know, won the Calder Cup final, AHL champions, he's 34, he's a younger candidate. And as Prashant also noted, there are some young candidates in the NCAA cycle as well. Uh, what does that do for you in terms of likelihood of uh, of going in a different direction? Because that's pro hockey. That's that's the AHL. He, he might be young, but that's not irrelevant in terms of, you know, are, could you potentially be an NHL head coach? Not much. No. Again, I don't think much has changed or different in the last couple of months. I, with the rumors about how many interviews and how many candidates Eiserman has, I would have been shocked if Forsovsky wasn't on that list to begin with. Forget, obviously, now that he's won a Calder Cup, that only helps his case. Um, some of the NCAA candidates, some of the other AHL coaches. I don't think this is Eiserman just zoning in on Tampa guys and waiting it out. I think these are all legitimate candidates and he's going to pick whoever he feels is the best fit. Do I give the Tampa guys uh, an advantage? Yeah, probably. I, I think they probably come in with like, you know, a 10% bump, however you want to quantify it because of who they are, where they are and, you know, histories, but you know, a good candidate can overcome that. So I, I'm, like I said, nothing has really changed much of how I felt about any of this or how I think any of this is going to play out to this point. How, on a scale of 1 to 10, how scared are you guys that this is going to drop just about as we're recording the draft preview episode? Which is, for those of you who don't know, one of our biggest episodes of the year. And like the amount of work that goes into that, the work and the preparation and the size of the episode, it's like our comprehensive summary of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Two episode weekend. No, um, no. What I'm more worried about is we got the long weekend coming up. I don't have any plans yet, but something probably will come uh, up. Where you have I'm a young family, yeah. Where I'm gonna travel, and that's ex 
exactly when it's going to happen. So when I text you and be like, oh, by the way, not that this is what it'll be, but like just by chance, oh, I'm going to Port Elgin on Friday. Brace yourselves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's when it's going to happen. I got the cottage this weekend. Yeah. And oh, our- so you've already got it covered for me. We yes. don't want it to happen. When are you going up? That's what I need to know. Thursday. Okay. Because we, you know what happened the last time I got there? Nick Letty trade happened literally as I got in the front door. I opened the cooler that we brought in, was about to grab my first drink, and then the Nick Letty trade happened. So, and, and, and Mel groaned, and I was like, you should break up with me now, by the way. <laughs> and here we are a year later. What a dummy. And anything big trade Eisenman's going to do to prep for the draft, like whether he's going to move a player out for picks in this draft, or he's going to you know move up or down in the draft, or anything that's going to happen is going to happen before, a, a week before. Because the way my schedule worked out, I was telling you before we recorded, starting as of this Thursday, I don't work for 10 days leading up to and after the draft. I have all the time in the world for whatever happens. So it's going to happen on the Wednesday. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. And you know <laughs> what? We deserve it because we joked so much about Max had his like, Max had a vacation that Max had a week uh, wedding to go to yeah. over a weekend. And we were like, oh, Max, thanks for your sacrifice. We appreciate it. This is the poor guy's job. Like, he has to be able to write about this. <laughs> we're making jokes about it. And now it's going to happen to us. Yeah. yeah. thousand percent. Evan's going to have 2,000 words ready for us. He's going to hit go. We're all just going to be blown away. I won't answer your phone call when you call me. Yeah, it's too bad. I know. I, I There's a there's an air tag somewhere in your in your stuff. So I won't tell you where, but we'll be able to find you. No matter where well, you know where I'll be, I'll either be at my house or at the golf course. There's the only two spots. Yeah, you're consistent at least. You do have yeah. a brand. Okay, uh, we are going to get talking about the meat of this episode, which is the prospect profile. But before we do that, I want to mention that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook. They're a sponsor that gives hockey fans what we really need: even more excitement in the game. There's so many reasons why FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. They're simple to use with great odds on different betting markets, giving you more action every game day. Plus, they're tons of fun with unique bet types like same game parlay and exclusive promos on the biggest events. And when you win, you'll get your winnings back safely in as little as 24 hours. Now listen to this. FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just place a bet on any game and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back in site credit if you don't win that first bet. If you win, you keep the cash. If you lose, you'll get up to $1,000 back in site credit. Now, what we want you to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app uh, today to get started with that bet, risk-free bet of up to $1,000. And be sure to sign up with promo code WWP so they know the Winged Wheel podcast sent you. That's FanDuel Sportsbook promo code WWP. You must be 21 and older and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real money wager only. Site credit is non-withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, or Virginia, Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789, 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia, or call 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan. Brad, it is time for your favorite prospect. Brad, the short king. The short Brad is advocating for the short kings. I wonder why Brad likes Matt you, so, you, so much. <laughs> you know what? Like going through the mock draft, I definitely did gravitate that way. But you can't just zone in on Savoy for that. This draft's actually got a lot of them in this range. <laughs> yes, uh, they do have quite a few short kings. Let, let's go over who are your... Because we, and it's not just you. Like I think Matt Savoy is the same height as you. Anyways, I think Matt Savoy is pretty average height. <laughs> just me right now off the cuff. So, and this isn't just you, Brad, but we make fun of you because, you know, you're louder than Evan and I. And so we're going to make you the poster boy of it. Who are, who are the Brad darlings in previous drafts? Last draft was um, uh, San Jose took him. Eklund. William Eklund. Eklund. Yeah. Eklund. Draft before was Raymond. Raymond. Draft before was... Um, at the wings pick, I was advocating for Zegers and Caulfield, so we're fifty percent there. Yeah, and then, yeah, I mean before that, yeah, Zadina, nobody was complaining when he got there. Yeah. yeah. So this year, is it fair for me to say that Savoy is, if you had to pick one name, Matt Savoy is the you know quote unquote Brad Darling? Yeah, yeah, that he's uh he's probably the only guy right now that I'm considering putting in my top five that isn't among the consensus top five in the scouting world. He uh, was at one point. And in my opinion, probably still should be because 
this tends- hold on, hold on, hold on. Matthew Savoy out of Winnipeg in the WHL, a much contested prospect because of his size and whether he can come in as a center or a winger, but one of the most talented, standing at five about five nine, one seventy five. Brad, go ahead. Yeah. So this th- there's always a prospect every year that seems to happen to. And in previous years, you know, Colt Caulfield would be a good example of that, where a prospect comes in ranked very highly going into his draft year. And Savoy going into this year was a consensus top consensus top three pick. And in my opinion, this season has done nothing to hurt his stock. He was phenomenal all year. And because there were a couple players who deservedly shot up the rankings and had very good seasons, mm-hmm. but were north of six feet tall, have displaced him in the top five. And, you know, you can argue merits and track record and whatever you want. But Savoy came into the draft very highly ranked, did nothing to hurt his stock, in my opinion, and his stock has fallen dramatically. Like he's been outside the top 10 in some rankings and mock drafts now, which is insane to me. Again, the most recent example I can think of that this happened to was Cole Caulfield. Cole Caulfield was very highly ranked going into his draft, had an unbelievable record setting draft year, and then fell to 15. And now looking back at it, everybody's like, well, that was stupid. Um, And, you know, obviously those aren't the only two examples, but the two most recent examples. So, I'm always puzzled when these drops happen because we knew Matt Savoy was five foot nine going into this year. He can do everything except grow. Yeah. It's hard, okay? <laughs> Not he, everyone is able to be you, boss. He's right. always been one of the best skaters in the draft. That didn't change. He was always one of the most competitive players in the draft. Oh, that didn't change. He was always one of the most skilled players in the draft. That didn't change. He always had a high hockey IQ. That didn't change. So why is he falling? Because the guys who have elevated their things are just bigger than him. That's that's the only logical conclusion I can come to, because do I think um, Slavkovsky and Cooley are better than him? Yes, probably, but not by much. Different positions, different styles, hard to compare. Do I think Nemec and Juracek are better than him? I'd say it's a coin toss. And do I think Savoy is better than everybody else in the draft behind them? Yeah, I do. So what changed? And... Man, do I think Savoy can play center? Yes, absolutely. You have, what is the aspect of Savoy's game? And I'll ask you guys this because maybe you have a different answer than I do. What is the aspect of Savoy's game that does not translate well to center other than the fact he's five foot nine? Some things that give me pause. Whenever there's a guy who's small, you they essentially need to, in my mind, prove a lot to say that they can compete at center, which is a physical demanding position at the NHL level that requires quite a bit of strength. And I think he's strong for his size, but then you have to make up for it in different ways. I think he's a good skater. Is he a good enough skater to play center at the NHL level and be that small? I think that's a fair question. He also has played quite a bit of wing this year as well, right? So seeing that, that doesn't necessarily make for a guy who's going to absolutely play wing and he's already out as a center, but it does raise the question, why is, he, why is he already flipped to the wing in the junior level? So, Winnipeg, yeah, and that's a fair point and a fair question because Winnipeg was an uber-talented team. So they were. They had a wealth of options at center. And like obviously, the US and TDP sometimes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Cutter Goche, one of the – who's shooting up the rankings because he's a center but played wing all year. Like, And that's just because they had a lot of talent. Yeah, that's a yeah, fair counter. Yeah, yeah exactly. So if, if we're going to be rocketing Goche up for these reasons, you can't knock Goche. Uh, you can't knock Savoy in the same argument. You just can't. The argument for Goche over Savoy is he's north of six feet. He's bigger. Big man. Every other aspect of the game outside of shot, I would say Savoy's better. Oh, Goche's got size and a shot. Not that Goche or Savoy are bad at either of the like opposites' weaknesses, per se. Obviously, they're top 10 talents, so they're very well-rounded. Um, but that's why Goche's ahead of him. And again, if he's a winger, he's a winger, but Matt Savoy on the wing still a really going to be a really damn good NHLer. Yeah, it, it goes back to the question, right, of play. the NHL is becoming more and more positionless every day. I don't really believe in saying 
the set like centers aren't important, but if you have a talented enough player who can create offense and, you know, be responsible with the puck and drive the play, they can't, you can do that from the wing. You can drive the play from the wing. It's not common. And I don't think it's smart to be drafting and, and, uh, scouting based on that. But if you have exceptional levels of talent, I think you can say this could be a thing. You're right, Brad. As much as it pains me to admit, you are right. Matt Savoy has exceptional levels of talent. There have been moments, you know, as you watch the progression of his junior career where you're like, is he just having a normal lack in production or is this a function of his size or lack thereof catching up to him? Um, But all in all, the toolkit is there. His offensive ability, his hockey IQ, his ability to create plays, specifically the work that he does in the offensive zone. Like this is a guy who you can see, this is who you want with the puck on their stick on the power play one. The way he hit, the way he hits seams, like his soft touch, his his ability to generate space through dekes and dangles. He's skilled. He's a good skater, I think. He's strong for his size, and if you're you're looking at the Eisenman check marks here, he has the hustle. Like he grinds. He's a water bug. Yeah, he genuinely like you joke, but he is a water bug out there. And his shot, he's a he's a sick shot too. Like his shot's great. So. The reason that the size thing gets brought up, I do think I do agree with you, Brad. I do think it gets overstated, but I also think it's fair because you're about to spend an eighth overall pick. And for a guy who's 5'9", which m- some people might notice is an inch shorter than me. I'm just putting it out there as a random fact. So close, though. So. Yeah. Um, right there. Bare, not even noticeable. <laughs> you're, it's like some people might say it's like kind of noticeable. But if you're spending an eighth overall pick on him and he doesn't pan out, or he pans out as a winger but doesn't drive the play the way you want, and then Cutter Goche is a surefire center. That's where those questions come from. And I agree with the points you made, Brad. Like, how do you elevate yeah. Goche and knock Savoy? I just don't think they're the exact same kind of player. And Savoy's size does pose some risk. So if I could like sit here and say, yeah, Savoy's absolutely going to overcome it, then you know someone pay me to do this for an NHL team. But what I will say is if you think Matt Savoy is going to overcome his size and at least be a top six winger or even a top six center if all goes right, then you take him, yeah, at five, at six. Like take him at four if you if you don't want one of the defensemen because the tools this guy have has are incredible. Yeah, and the question that it might come down to for Red Wings specifically, if, if you believe both these guys ultimately hit their ceiling, what would you rather have, a second-line center in Cutter Goche or a first-line winger in Matt Savoy? <laughs> Neutral NHL team, first line winger. The Detroit Red Wings, man. <laughs> the it's Detroit, worth, it's, it's worth asking. Yeah, for the Detroit Red Wings right now, I would, I would honestly say, don't make me pick. <laughs> I was about to say Cutter Gochi, but I don't know, Evan. You answer that question. I mean, if Matt Savoy, he's got the tools to overcome his lack of size. Um, that much is obvious. If he hits his absolute ceiling, like he is a ninety-point player in the NHL, like if he hits he, his absolute ceiling, he's Braden Point. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he skates better than Braden Point does. But I mean, Braden Point it, has has now established himself in the in the NHL, and like it's very hard to be like, well, you know, he's Braden Point. But I need someone else small to make it in and do what Braden Point did because I'm tired, so tired. tired yeah, name. honestly. Yeah. And um, and again, it's it's worth mentioning. Prospects don't hit their ceiling more often than they do. Cider is an example of them hitting their ceiling. Your other favorite Red Wings prospect is an example of what happens to m- the vast majority of everyone else. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I mean, Lucas Raymond. So. Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> Having two examples countering my point was bad, bad radio, but, you know, I'll take the lump. Yeah, like, I don't know. Matt Savoy's got all the tools to be an elite top six forward in the NHL, whether it be at center or wing. To me, it doesn't really matter what position he ends up playing. So you're, if you're the Red Wings, you don't care. If you believe in Matt Savoy, you're not giving the edge to a center who might who you might think is a little less talented. No. We do know for a fact that the Red Wings are impressed by Matt Savoy. It doesn't that doesn't mean a lot in the grand scheme of things, but they've they've taken note of him and they are impressed by what he does on and off the ice. So he is a player of note for the Red Wings. Actually outside of the game atmosphere, it's probably worth mentioning. Um obviously it only factored in CHL prospects, but uh at the top prospects game, the on ice testing they did the day before the game, Matt Savoy crushed everybody. Yeah, he was he, like- he was he was winning most whatever 
categories you want in terms of the skating uh, drills, whatever you want to call them, assessments, rankings. Yeah, like the reaction time stuff. Yeah, he he was crushing that and um, little water bug. And he was yep. probably he was probably outside of Jagger Fergus the best player in that game as well. Again, small sample size. Um, and even though he's five nine, he sure as hell doesn't play like he's five nine. That guy will drive the net. That guy will take the middle of the ice. And you know, Frank Nazer, if you're advocating for a smaller forward who also who definitely plays center, you can make that case for him as well. I just think uh, ultimately Savoy's more skilled than uh, Nazer. But um, yeah, I don't know. the The world of outcomes for Savoy is w- wide. It is. There, there is a lot of scenarios for Savoy uh, in in the future. So, which makes him obviously super intriguing and exciting, but also, yeah, comes inherently with more risk. Can you name me the picks before who the team's picking before Detroit again in the order? Yeah. It's Montreal, New Jersey, Arizona, Seattle, Philly, Columbus, Ottawa, Detroit. And then right behind them are Buffalo and Anaheim. I'm just trying to think of, you know, we always play that game. What would you do if you were X GM? I'm, I'm trying to play that game and inserting Matt Savoy in there and if they would do it. I look I look at what GMs have types traditionally speaking. I if Savoy goes before Detroit, my money would be on Columbus at 6. Oh, I was going to say Ottawa. Oh, Ottawa is the least likely for me. You they so? they t- they love their big physical hard-nosed types. They do, but maybe they want to start stocking those up with they, some uh, skill. Oh, the team that needs Matt Savoy more than anybody else in this is Ottawa, don't get me wrong, cuz they have went for too many Tyler Boucher's and Tyler Clevins of the world and they need a few more Matt Savoy's. Right. Um, but Yarmo has been the guy who's gambled on talent in the past uh, between Chinnikov re- reaching way down the list for Chinnikov to get a goal scorer. Kent Johnson last year, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Yarmo does Philly doesn't strike me as a likely option, which means that's definitely where he's going to go. Um, Philly strikes me as a defenseman or Goche team, but yeah, I don't know. It's uh, if, if he's not available for Detroit, I'm, I'm thinking Columbus at six. I think with the players that are, up there in the rankings like there's a really good chance that matt savoy is there for detroit based on most rankings and mock drafts i'd say it's very likely he's there for we detroit. need bobs on tuesday or whenever it's coming out yeah that's gonna really help sort of paint the picture the top, of what teams are thinking yeah you got the five who are almost certainly gone gonna be gone before detroit and then there's a lot of traction on goche ahead of him and then that basically leaves one spot for you know, Savoy, Kamel, Lakaramaki, Nazer, Casper. There's a lot of possibilities here. And with the way centers get premium, yes. if the top five goes as the top five, it almost looks like it might be Goche Casper because those are the two big centers getting traction right now. So all of a sudden, your, your two surefire centers that the Red Wings are looking at aren't there. So now if you want a center, you're looking at Nazer or Savoy or one of the less likely options, or you have to reach for a Oslin or geeky or, and that's, that's assuming teams operate as expected, which just doesn't happen no. in the NHL draft. There's always the Barrett Hayton's, the, I can honestly see <laughs> most hiders of yeah. the world. If someone believes in geeky, I can see him going before Detroit. I wouldn't call it likely, but it's possible. And then that it pushes strikes me as an Ottawa pick that pushes someone who Brad just said, like, these five players shouldn't slip past five between, you know, Wright, Slavkovsky, Cooley, Juracek, Nemec. One of those guys might be there. It's almost, to me, it's almost a certainty that either Matt Savoy is available at Detroit's pick or a premium. someone in the top five drops to into that eight range. Based on position need type of player, like uh, understanding the way the draft is likely to play out, the four that I personally have kind of seemed to put in the group of these are the four that two of the four that are going to be there for the Red Wings. And I'm very, very happy with any of them would be Savoy, Nazer, Goche, Casper. Mm -hmm. And the way this draft is looking like it's going to shake out, two of them will be there. And I don't, and I would say the two most likely to be there will be Savoy and Nazer. But like you said, this draft, there is always that one team that goes shocks everybody and it happens every year we don't know who or where that's going to be this year but 
There's a couple teams. It could, ahead. Be, it could be the first pick. <laughs> There's a few teams ahead of Detroit this year that uh, that are gonna that are very likely to make it interesting. Okay, so to wrap it up on Savoy, where <laughs> we'll start with Brad. Where do you have him on your personal rankings in terms of what you would love to see happen for Detroit? Assuming you know a Wright or a Cooley or Slavkovsky don't fall. So if the like just will operate within what's reasonable. Okay. He's my preferred pick. Sim- plain and simple. If the draft ahead of Detroit goes somewhat as expected, even with one huge curveball, that still means the five are gone. And even I'm not convinced that I like Nemec and Juracek that much more than Savoy. I, I think Savoy is my guy. I would say, and I think he's at around six for you. Yeah. Like six overall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's but in- will he get taken six overall? I have I'm I have no certainty in him whatsoever. Yeah, I, I have him in my four to six range. Like I th- I think I have him in for me. He's in the same category talent wise as a Nemec and a Yurchek. Um. So obviously, if he makes it to eight, great. I'm happy. Um. Just for context. In terms of, and I'm I'm using a different metric here than than Evan, but. In terms of like who I think will be available for the Red Wings, he's sitting around three, two on a good day. Uh, I think I'm still at a point, and it's it's fluid for me, but I'm still at a point where I'm more interested in a Nazar right now than a Savoy. But there's a premium being given to position here. But regardless uh, of where you come in on that spectrum. Matt Savoy is going to be a super interesting prospect before, during, and after the draft. So let us know what you think about him, um, either in the comments below or send a certified letter to Evan's house. I'll DM you his address. Uh, it's, I probably should mention, too, that I generally tend to fall on the side of I'm willing to make the gamble and reach for talent. Yeah, because not, it's not your job. On the exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm like, give me whoever I think has the highest ceiling. Give me that guy. What's the worst thing that happens? The team keeps the receipts and we get slammed in a video <laughs> <laughs> three years later. Um, okay. Funny story before we go into. Hey, if I would have known that was most Sider's upside. I just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> if we could have seen the future, we could have seen the future. <laughs> you guys got slammed, not me. That's true. Yeah, you we showed up. I was at a cottage. Evan, we know. <laughs> Speaking of life just going Evan's way, funny story for you, Brad, and I actually didn't tell you this yet. Someone, <laughs> oh God. Someone tweets at us the other day and uh, they're like, Evan, you, oh my God, you got quoted in the New York Times. There's an article about Mo Sire and the Red Wings. You got quoted in the New York Times. Evan, who's this, you know, tall, you know, good looking dude, only good things ever happened to him. Like his life just like the, the path gets laid in front of him as he walks and he just walks along blissfully like a golden retriever, just kind of like happy and stupid. And he's like, oh, sweet. That's random. And I saw that and I was like, Evan, it was a misquote. It wasn't you. When did you get on the phone with anyone from the New York Times, Evan? Think, just think about it for a second, buddy. The fact that you got on the phone with someone and they didn't remember who you were <laughs> is what sh- is what's a joke. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm just not memorable. Or they're like, maybe I had a really good conversation with them. And they were like, well, that couldn't have been that dummy Ryan. It must have been Evan. Not my problem. Not my problem. Yeah, no. Uh, our friend um, Neil Baudet wrote an article about Moritz Sider and... Uh, there were a couple lines. Um, we we had a good conversation about the Red Wings insider and the rookie uh, rookies, and he was kind enough to um, to quote me and the Winged Wheel podcast in the article. So go check it out in the Times. And um, Evan, congratulations on your your brief but momentous yep. quote. Yep. <laughs> I love how you just took it and roll. You're like, yeah, that's normal for my day. I don't know. Maybe I did say it. Yeah, I got I got a Peeler surprise earlier, and I just I never wrote a book in my life. Uh, okay. Let's get into some news from across the NHL. Patrice Bergeron coming back. Bit of a surprise. Com- competitors compete. Yeah. Players play. Yes, but I don't think Patrice Bergeron has pain receptors. Okay. Boston might be in a little bit of hurt here, right? You ever heard of SEPA? No. Congenital insensitivity to pain. Bergeron must have it. There's no <laughs> other way. No, but seriously, Boston is going to have a rough time with injuries and how they're going to come back ready for an October start to the season. 
Is Patrice Bergeron interested in coming back for a team that's not competing for the Cup? Am I now doing that thing, though, where I'm starting to bet against Boston again, which is a historically stupid thing to do? They're only losing their top players for a part of the season. Uh, you know, It's that- a good part of the season, but it's only part of the season. Mm. They then have to bank on, like... Playing Ottawa, Detroit, Buffalo, and Montreal a ton. Yeah. I think I think Ottawa and Buffalo are two teams who can make who can take some steps. Consider depending on how they approach this offseason, they could put some pressure. Detroit as well. I definitely half agree with you on that statement. You think Buffalo, not Ottawa? Yeah, yeah. I'm still I, and not, that's fine. I'm still not sold on Ottawa at all. I'm not sold on Ottawa either. But you you, you can make moves to get better in the short term. Anyways, all this said, Bergeron's coming back. It's a, I guess, I mean, it's a win for Boston because it was looking bleak there for a minute, but um, still kind of is. But they're Boston, so all Boston sports teams just trip and fall into good things. They're it's the, like they're, they're the Evans yeah. of professional sports. Yeah, they really are. Yeah, Tom Brady leaving was the first bad thing that had to happen to Boston. It was like, in, and they still made the playoffs. <laughs> and then something truly awful happened to them, which is fine. <laughs> it's great. It was momentous like, day. It was three hundred where they uh, threw the arrow and it hit the uh, the go- the the. Per- supposed god in the cheek and like just to show that he could bleed that was that was what happened to boston sports <laughs> anyhow um okay let's get into some players who might be available pierre-luc dubois being on the market two years in advance winnipeg is going to have a decision to make and like you said evan leading up into this episode there are a lot of players who might be on the outs there so what do you do with pierre-luc dubois if you're winnipeg Oh, if you're Winnipeg, you trade him ASAP while well, value's peaked because that team, like you said, is looks like they're heading for the cliff. So you might as well, you know, maximize value. What am I if I'm Detroit with Pierre Luc Dubois? Nothing, not a damn thing. Oh my God, there are so many red flags here. I just really. First of all, he is not as good as he's been advertised, and at no point outside of a two week series against Toronto has he been as good as advertised. Sixty point center. He 24 is, years old. He is a very good second line center. Don't when the, the Wings, hell has he been talked about as a second line center? Don't the Red Wings need a very good second line center? Not, but he is not advertised, talked about, or cost of a second line center. I think he's better than a, a very good second line center. No, I, I absolutely do. Like, I, he's a very good player. Like, I don't want this to sound like I'm dumping on Pierre Luc Dubois saying he's garbage. Brad hates if he Pierre Luc Dubois. Five nine. Would you like him more? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> No, he's he's a very good second line center. I promise you, he's not costing you what a second line center would in terms of trade assets or contract. And uh, Winnipeg oh, he's six two. Like, that's why Brad. Uh, yeah. yeah, but also things didn't go well for him in Columbus. There was the rift between him and whatever forced him to um caught like uh, forces trade demand, and now Winnipeg. With him, things aren't going great, and he's already saying, "Nah, I'm testing the market two years out." Why would is it? How is it not going great though? I mean, everything's kind of a mess in Winnipeg. Exactly. I don't know if that's a Dubois thing or if it's not a Dubois thing, but the fact that he's already two years out saying, "Nah, I'm testing the market," he's looking to cash out. Probably. Maybe and he doesn't go- like. And he's going to because that's the reputation he has. Okay, and I'm sorry for to the people who live but, in these two cities. I'm sure they're great, but he's a, a a young millionaire hockey player, and he's lived in Columbus and Winnipeg. He's no, no offense if he's going by that. Detroit's probably not going to be very likely favorite spot for him either. Maybe love, he does love Detroit, but okay. May, look at the outlook. Maybe he saw the outlook in Columbus and said, mm, "This team just lost Panarin and Bobrovsky. I don't think they're going to compete." He's seeing what's <laughs> happening in Winnipeg. He's like. This was which, turmoil in the dressing room. I don't think they're going to compete. Which is all very, very fair points. But they're also it's also a risk that I'm not willing to take when you are going to have to give up significant assets and cap space to acquire him. The Red Wings draft. This is a guy that you look past. This the, is a guy. I just like doing that. Yeah. This is a guy that the Red Wings can look past those flags if he's... Connor McDavid, Nathan McKinnon. Like, you can't miss. Absolute. Yep. Yeah, this guy is so damn good. We don't care what baggage he comes with. We don't care what risks he comes with. He is that damn good. Do you trade eighth overall for Pierre Luc Dubois? No, I don't. Do you Absolutely trade eighth not. overall for Pierre Luc Dubois? Mm, no, I don't think so. I'd rather get someone who's six or seven years younger, contract certainty. Yeah, so you get three years of value out of an ELC. Um, and then, you know, usually coming out of an ELC, the contract's not as bloated as what. Dubois' next contract is going to look like, which is coming at age 
26 or 27, which, like you said, he's probably going to want to cash out as he should. Not knocking Dubois for wanting to cash out. He absolutely should. But now you're looking at a eight-year contract for a dude and his, you know, on the wrong side of 25. So value-wise, again, is it likely that an eighth overall pick is going to be as good as Pierre-Luc Dubois? No, I think that's about what we're hoping for as a Red Wings fan. Um, that's, I, that's almost I actually, best case scenario. Actually, actually I think Marco Ca- uh, Dubois might be a good comparison for Marco Casper now that I think about it. Um, but yeah, and it's the risk that he doesn't pan out. But again, we talked about this uh, with the DeBrinket thing and versus someone like Joaquin Kamel. Where's the talent versus value certainty? Uh, six years younger, three years of an ALC, lesser of a contract, but if they're only 85% as good as Pierre-Luc Dubois, is that still worth it? In my opinion, I'd say yeah. That probably still is worth it. I understand you're saying he's not this like bona fide. Um... Again, very, very good player. But what's the argument we've been having for years about? Is Dylan Larkin a surefire first line center? Is he a second line center on a good line? Dubois is not as good as Dylan Larkin. Uh, that so, was going to be because okay. so because Dubois like right he he becomes an unrestricted free agent in a couple yeah. of years. He's he, right now they have to sign him. Does he have arbit? He does have arbit rights. Yeah, so he has arbitration rights. He's a restricted free agent right now and and that was going to be my question as well. Like he has to sign a contract right now. Larkin's going to have to sign a contract in a year, a different level. Larkin's going to be a UFA. Yeah. And where do they stack up? And you have Larkin above Dubois right now. Yeah, and I would say pretty definitively above Dubois. Like not that Dubois is light years behind Larkin, but Larkin's a better center. Larkin's a better player. So the way I see it, okay, let's say the Red Wings draft Savoy and Savoy lands as a center or uh, a winger, sorry. Yep. Then you just gave up a premium pick. You're probably not drafting that high again if all things go well. So you're starting to move. You're Steve Eisman, you're starting to move. You're signing players. Uh, you're trying to get better. You got to find a center behind Dylan Larkin. Pierre Luc Dubois, who's going to sign a, a, a contract right now as a restricted free agent, maybe in a couple of years, he's going to be uh, a UFA. That's kind of a guy who's available a lot. There's a perfect storm here. I'm not even necessarily a massive advocate for this. I'm just saying it's not easy to get young, talented, definitive top six centers. And I think Pierre Luc Dubois does that. And if the the Jets are squeezed, then the Jets are squeezed. Yeah, but again, there's always solutions somewhere, trade, free agency, whatever. Because maybe you don't need to. Again, there's a million ways to build a team, but maybe there's you don't need to get a second line center as good as Pierre Luc Dubois. If the two wingers flanking him are Matt Savoy and Tyler Bertuzzi. Right. Right. Like those are two wingers who could absolutely carry um, hypothetically a, a peaked out Joe Valeno, who's obviously not as good as Pierre-Luc Dubois, but you know, Hey, he's good enough to let these guys run. And all of a sudden you have a very good second line where the wingers are carrying the bulk of the work. So that turned into a much bigger discussion than what I was anticipating, but it's yeah. an interesting thought, right? Yeah, because like never come up on the market. Yeah, what is your? How do you feel about a top six where you have a Jonathan Bergeron who's you know closest to ceiling, Larkin Raymond, and then you still have a very good Tyler Bertuzzi, uh, we'll call close to ceiling Matt Savoy. All of a sudden, that second line center doesn't seem as much of a problem because the talent around it in the top six is so immense that it's very easy to hide one weak spot. I don't think you're wrong. Again, this is the optimistic view. A, you draft a winger and he pops out. Yeah. A, Bergeron gets to the NHL and, and he pops off, which are by no means guarantees. But but all okay, even a lot of I, things have to go right either way for – Like just taking your hypothetical of all those things going right, my brain still goes, you need better than Joe Valeno or Joe Valeno needs to – I'm just t- saying I use them as an example. You go sign an Andrew Kopp in free agency okay, for okay, like okay. $5 million less than what Dubois is going to ask or something like that, right? Yeah, that's another thing. Dubois. Which is like, I don't love that option either, but I prefer that option. A, not giving up eighth overall, and B, getting a center who's probably 75% as good, like for a lot less money and no trade assets. And that's the last thing here, right? Is is this is an atypical situation. We're talking about Dubois being saying he wants to test the uh, UFA waters in a couple of years. When he's only 24 now. But then it's and, worth remembering he'll be 26 then. And he still has to sign a last RFA contract right now. Yeah. So to give the team that notice, like it's a very atypical conversation. So <laughs> yeah, if Winnipeg's looking to trade him, honestly, Dubois might be a fun pump and dump for the Red Wings. 
<laughs> I'm just saying, bring him in for half a season, give him all the ice time power play minutes he wants, and then flip him with a year and a half left at a reasonable contract for a ransom. We are getting that's that's galaxy branding. Yeah, we're get, we're getting that is something I wouldn't rule out Stevie doing. We're getting weird. So why don't we jump into recapping what's happened in the Stanley Cup uh, play or Stanley Cup final right now? We're about 40 minutes away from Game Six puck drop, but the last two games. What's happened? Nazem Kadri comes in after a dominant overtime from Colorado, splits the D, a man with a bare minimum capacity to shoot, scores, and wins the game to put to give Colorado a commanding 3-1 lead. There's controversy because he was the player who came in pretty far ahead of the bench. It was McKinnon who went off. Yeah. Uh, and it was, I mean, technically too many men. And that was a whole thing. And then game five, Tampa Bay eked it out and were able to bring the series back to game six and stave off elimination in, in Colorado. So the drama has been insane. Like we talked about before, the series has been just so good. And you know what I'll say? And and some people might be rolling their eyes at this. I'm happy this is like a gray too many men call, something that we see all the time rather than another offside review. I'll take the too many men drama over anything else. No, we need to stop talking about it. We should have never talked about it. We should have gotten over it right away. What, like too many men call? Yeah. Why? Do you want another review? Because this is how you get another review. <laughs> yeah, that's another, like you're, you're, it's, it's happening. I'm not joking. No, no, it's this already, is, it's already. This is a very real concern I have. It's already going to happen. They're going to make it a reviewable play. Because of this one play, even though Tampa had seven players on the ice fractions of a second before Colorado had six. Like, I also like how they can't review pucks over the glass. There were, happened last night where they weren't sure if it was... Brad's going to reach across this table and kill you. Well, if they're going to do everything else, they might as well include that because that was a huge <laughs> moment in the game. <laughs> okay, I want you to know, I didn't say anything here. So when you're done beating him to a pulp, <laughs> I'm innocent. Well, the, the context around it's way different than like, oh, if some guy's like half an inch ahead, like did that really change the outcome of a play? Whereas, Of course it, it didn't. Yes. <laughs> But if someone deflects, need to if someone deflects a puck or not out of play, that is a mean, huge... That, that has, results in a power play, not a goal that's less relevant. Well, I mean, it can change the momentum and lead to a goal. You know what changes the way momentum more than lead, something that could lead to a goal? A goddamn goal! <laughs> well, we should... De- it, it, it should be, because the ref's huddling over like a bunch of fucking potatoes... Oh yeah, the whole, everything about this is that shouldn't even be a rule. That puck over glass is so such a stupid rule, but eh, I can't. The Anyways, NHL. The games are already three and a half hours long. Like, what's another two minutes? I I I think it was too many men. I think yeah, people point out Lightning had seven, but that was like you catch people in the middle of a line change. Yes, for a brief moment in that gray area, there are going to be more players on than off. I think with the amount of he- like lead time that Kadri got and the fact that it, he was the operative one man too many and the one who scored the goal, I understand the gripe from Tampa. I also see the flip side of the coin. Both teams cheat too many men and coming off the bench literally as much as possible. If you've played hockey, you edge, you inch, you inch, you inch, you inch as far into like the zone of cheating on that as much as you can until you get pushed back from the refs, either in the form of a warning or a minor. Every person in every sport does it. It's, it's unfortunate to me that it happened at this point in the game. Um, I, if I, if this happened to the Red Wings in the Stanley cup final, there would be five episodes about it. It would be tattooed on the inside of my eyelid. So I would never forget it. But in terms of being a neutral spectator, I can. I think I'm landed in a spot of, yeah, it was too many men. I think it happens all game. I think I would have preferred to have seen it called, but it, it kind of just falls into, that's how it shakes out in hockey. And until we have robo refs or you review that, it's, it's how it's going to be. And it's fine. Plays like this, like fractional offsides, it's fine. I've come up with a test for plays like this. So I take my opinion out of it right away. The is Twitter angry about it test. <laughs> we should make the is Brad angry about it test. You get three minutes on your Twitter timeline after the goal is scored. If nobody is expressing angry, it means they didn't notice it. It wasn't that big a deal. Uh, or you could be in an echo chamber. Us? No. Oh uh, no! I've my my Twitter follows are pretty all over the place. So I didn't see a damn mention about too many men until well after the celebrations had subsided. 
and everybody had time to watch a billion replays. And then someone went, wait, is this offside? And then everyone went, oh, holy, or not offside, too many men. And then everyone, went, oh, holy shit, it is. Nobody noticed it in the moment, so I'm not rattled about it. It wasn't egregious. Was it too many men? Oh, yeah, definitely. Obviously. Was it so flagrant that it's worth being angry about unless you're literally the team being affected by it? No, probably not. And John Cooper did bring it up in his postgame presser, and then he got his too many men on the ice call yeah. the two days later. So yeah. masterful. If I was a Lightning fan, I'd be livid, but that's how sports work. Shit like that happens all the time. Uh, we're going to jump into overtime here uh, on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, and we're going to start uh, with our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast, if you want to join the Dub Dub Club, support the show, allow us to do things like make far too many jokes about uh, Brad advocating for short kings, um, continue our draft profiles. We have a ton, a ton of draft content coming your way, and that is all made possible by our Patreon supporters. So again, thank you to all the members of our the Dub Dub Club. And uh, yeah, there's a couple of people. I was talking to a couple uh, of the listeners at the LCA and they were like, oh, I'm so-and-so. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I remember from the last event. And they were like, I'm, you know, so-and-so on the Discord. I'm like, okay, yeah, actually that registers to me with me yeah. more. It's such a pathetic, like, you know, c- chronically online way, but people's like usernames and handles stick to me more than names. That makes me a bad person, I know. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Jiggly Pigs, who says, who do you think were the best teams to never win the cup? For example, if Colorado ends up losing this year. Oh, man. Um, oh, seven senators come to mind. Um, I'll stay away from Detroit teams just because, you know, too much pain. What other ones immediately come to mind? 2011 Canucks. Oh, nine Red Wings. Shut up. Right? Like, is that not the first answer? Oh, wait, Penguins? <laughs> I said I'm staying away from the Red yeah. Wings answers here. Uh, just there tracking. are a lot over the years. Like, there are oh, a lot of talented. Like, Tampa I'm Bay. I'm just thinking about teams that went to the cup final to make it get easy. Because the obvious answer here is the 95 96 Red Wings, but they didn't even make it to the finals. So, yeah, those are the two that immediately jumped to mind for me. So, I'll go with that. Uh, question here from Frank Stanley, who says, who deserves to be in the Raptors first, Fedorov or Ozzy? Fedorov, for sure. Look, I, I love Ozzy. I appreciate, you know, the role he played for the Red Wings in that, and I think he's underappreciated, but that's Fedorov, and it's not a contest. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of caliber of player, they're both great, but in different, on different planets. Uh, Bill Nye the Thigh Guy says, which team is poised to make the biggest splash this offseason? I think Seattle's a front runner for needing more talent, period, and I think Ottawa will shock us. Are we talking for good and or bad reasons? Yeah, they're like just they're you think they're they could do it. Oh, this Philadelphia? Yeah, it's a thousand percent gonna be Philadelphia. They, they are the, so bad right now. They're and, in the upside down world. And they really don't want to be bad. They are gonna have to make a lot of moves. Yeah, I see what you mean now by like for good or bad reason. Because yeah. should Philly be poised? Like they're they're, they're going to have to make some decisions on pro overall. Like that's a whole situation that they want to make the playoffs. They do not want to rebuild. Uh, and their team was so bad. They finished f- fifth last in the NHL last year. So uh, standing Pat's not an option for them. Ottawa, is, I think is a good point. At some point, Buffalo is going to have to go, right? Yeah. But I think that's expected. If, if Buffalo goes out and makes a couple big signings or big trades, they'll, they strike me as a team that will at least make sense. Whether or not they work out will be up for debate long term. But like you'd be like, yeah, no, that I I I seen that coming. Yeah. Whereas Philly, man, I think they could be complete wild cards in terms of trades, going absolutely balls out for a big free agent that they have no business signing, like giving Johnny Goudreau twelve mil a year just to get him or something crazy like that. And then they also say, um, I have no interest in golf, but the OT bits of Evans golf talk is absolute gold. <laughs> Did you pay him to write that? Nope. <laughs> that was actually Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. I'm still hurt over that. Uh, Stay Fresh Cheesebags says, hey there, fellas. A recent tweet from Alan Walsh. Gary Bettman continues to tout, or Gary Bettman continually touts the NHL's triple hard cap salary cap system as ushering in parity. A leading hockey journalist sent this to me. Not so sure about parity. I've s- spent a shit ton of playoff nights in the same three or four cities over the last 10 years. 
So I come to you again with this. Does the NHL actually have true parity? What even is parity? Is it the same general group of teams at the top of the league year after year with a few tanks bottoming, bottoming out and a middling rotation fighting for a cup of coffee in the playoffs? Should the league adopt measures from other cap leagues like a limited luxury tax like the NBA, lifting guaranteed contracts so that albatrosses and retirements can be cut NFL, or a wider gamut uh, between cap floor and ceiling? Both. My new place of employment has poutine, or at least what Americans think poutine is. Check food discord for thoughts. J Fresh cheese bags. I'm scared to check, but I will after this. Thoughts on the parody discussion. So if you look at this over a five to 10 year sample, no cap versus salary cap are basically two means that lead to the same end. Where it's different is a salary cap creates equality of opportunity because everybody has to play so the same restrictions because without a salary cap, it'll be the same thing where you see the same handful of teams in the cup final over and over again because they can just spend infinity dollars and all that. The benefit of a non uh, sa- of no salary cap is bad teams can turn it around quicker because they can literally just throw money at their problems and they can, but then it comes to the problem as well. Half the league can't do that. So then you get your teams that just live in the basement forever. Where the salary cap does is it does lead to extreme inequality in teams, but in cycles. Because now the very much tried, tested, and true formula, if done right, is full rebuild, acquire your core, and then you have your solid core of good players that you keep for as long as you effing can and you go all in until you squeezed every last bit out of that team and then you rebuild again. So the really truly elite teams can build such a good core through young training for young players in the draft that when they get up there like a Tampa, like a Pittsburgh, you know, luck of the lottery, <laughs> notwithstanding, and Chicago for a while there. And then this is our team. It's really good. We got them all in the draft. We got them all young. We can ride this for as long as we can. But that only lasts for so long. So now, and then the cycle repeats. And then, you know, teams rebuild and blow it. But that's on them. That's not on the league system. If you sign shitty players, make shitty trades, and draft poorly, that's on you. That's not on the salary cap. So it sucks either way because you are going to get a lot of repetition. But at least under the salary cap, It'll go in waves because the Red Wings right now are terrible. But do we all think they're going to be terrible in five years? No. And do we think that their success when they get there is going to be sustainable? Yeah, probably. I'm going to come out here and say I'm pretty pro salary cap ever since it came in. So if you're like that comes with a certain amount of bias. Also, inherently, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit guilty of being a hockey purist. I hate when hockey. I don't hate when hockey changes. I'm scared of when hockey changes, but I can appreciate that I'm sometimes wrong about that so those are the qualifiers right out the gate i like the salary cap i think it does a lot right and i remember a pre-salary cap nhl and i think it just made for a system like brad really eloquently outlined there a lot of flaws is it perfect no because as brad just said it it has its own cycles and there's ways where it's where it's not perfect i think two things are at play here that are making it a little worse right now one really tough economic times everywhere but for the nhl the salary cap has not increased in a way that has kind of staved off the talks of this is now squeezing our players and guys are making less than equivalent talent athletes in other sports when and that should catch up i think that'll soften a bit two i think there is work to be done and this is where the biggest imperfection is for me with the draft lottery i think it's you need to find a way to in my mind either incentivize You need to choose between incentivizing, trying, even when you suck, so that teams aren't bottoming out in a way that's not fun for fans or viewers. And it really shows when teams suck and, you know, you're like, that team's not even trying to win and that's not fun for the sport. So you need to find a way to incentivize it, refer to the gold plan as as one example, or you need to make sure that when teams suck, they have all the tools at their disposal to not suck for long, which is whether you agree or not, and I'm not sure if I do. If you were the worst team in the league, you get the best pick in the draft. I know, Evan, you often advocate for that. Yep. The, the It's two. I think the risk here, and which is what makes this worse, is that you stick teams in the bottom of the cycle that Brad described 
for too long through arbitrary luck. And you need to get rid of that one way or another. And then I think the system will work not flawlessly, but even better. If the NHL is going to start making NBA NFL money, yeah, I mean, let's talk then. But they're not. Where when the Arizonas, Nashvilles, Ottawas of the world can spend with the New Yorks and Torontos of the world, then yeah, who cares about a salary cap? You want to win? Okay, go pay, you know, Connor McDavid $23 million a year when he hits free agency. Fine. But until every team can do that, no. And right now, would there be more than a dozen teams that could do that in the NHL right now? So, yeah. Be, make a better product. That's not my problem. You can't if my if I run my business better than you, that's not my problem. I'm I'm always in favor of just the worst teams getting the first pick in the NFL, but then again, you do want to avoid the tanking. So I've always I'm not smart enough to come up with a solution here, but I've always wondered if there's a way to tie in draft pick to revenue sharing. So like literally, uh, we're going to give you the pick, but like monetary wise, this is going to affect you somehow, some way. Like the teams that do you so you have a choice between more money or better pick? You're saying exactly like hey, let's we need some money for next year, so like we got to win, we got to stay out of the basement, something like that. Arizona's drafting ninth every year; they need every dollar. Yeah, but that's what I mean, though. But then that ultimately hurts them long term, right? So I hate the seller cap. You know, I I hate it. I think it's the stupidest well, thing. In wealthy the, man hates people being restricted. <laughs> I think it's the stupidest thing ever. Like, what if you draft four guys, five guys who are absolute superstars, and you did your due diligence, and now you can't pay them? That's yeah, you got to let one point. guy go because of this stupid salary cap. It is, but this I hate it. That's I, not true. Tampa, Chicago, they kept all their guys, all their core important guys. For their entire Tampa, window. Or Chicago had to trade Panarin and Tampa has no Chicago traded to Panarin because they were idiots and they thought. But anyways, but no, they. Well, they, they would have had to do it regardless. They had to trade their secondary guys. They had to lose like the Bufflins and some of those guys of the yeah, world. But, just Dustin Bufflin. Who, no. Okay. But no, but he I mean, wasn't Dustin Bufflin at he that wasn't. point. Yeah. He turned into but a trade they, later. Keith, Seabrook, Tays, Kane, yeah. none yeah, of them yeah. had to go when they were in their primes. Look at Tampa now. Cups. Stamkos, Kucherov, Point, Hedman haven't gone anywhere. Pittsburgh, oh, Crosby, they also got them Crosby Malkin, Latang. That. But that's part of the point of a salary cap. You have to so be you're a good paying GM players manage it. less when they should be making more. Oh yeah, for from the a player, player perspective, that's oh. also bullshit. Like I wouldn't yeah. want to be making less either. Yeah, no, don't get me wrong. I I hate it for the players, but like you know, to me. The thing that solves this is you do a designated player or Ooh, I like that. Who, who doesn't count against the cap and you could do something like if you've drafted this player, you get, I don't know, 10% more that you can offer them in salary than teams who are trying to get him elsewhere. I like kind the rewarding like a, for the draft. Like have something like a franchise tag. Like, hey, but it's it can only be for guys you drafted yeah. so like edmonton Connor mcdavid were franchise tagging him till his contract's up you can have it one guy every year so they could just slap it on mcdavid every year he doesn't ca- count towards our cap like 50 percent, maybe even it doesn't have to be whole yeah contract. exactly so then no Evan- all, don't make it confusing i do not want to do this <laughs> math yeah you get one he guy doesn't ev- count every year and tevin's point then you don't lose your guys we're not getting punished like for tampa for example okay well we haven't had a first overall pick in a long time but we drafted a superstar in the third round brain point why should we get punished for that well now you can slap that label on brain point every year and he doesn't cost you anything i don't know why they can't do that the gang solves the salary cap You're because possible. because the ottawa's and the arizona's of the world won't spend over the cap and they can't they not... can't spend to the cap now i know that's... it's i they should and, and i'm that... toronto and boston too bad yeah no. i'm floating your team anyway and yeah. i'm on board with that because they are floating if there is teams. a salary cap and teams are still spending under way under the salary cap i am of the there mindset f them cap. let them fail but it's got to at least be equality of opportunity to keep it. Then the the garbage organizations will flow to the bottom. There should be a salary floor, not a, a top. There, well, there is, but it's yeah. too it's too low. Yeah. All right, so I think I have the topic for our first bonus episode. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for that. Okay, we're gonna wrap up and record the Patreon exclusive overtime. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, again, we're really pumped. We're really geared up for the draft profiles and the draft content that's coming. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our listeners, uh, the sponsors of this podcast, the FanDuel Sportsbook, the uh, name level sponsors on Patreon, the heart and soul of this podcast, Arjun Shanker. Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Ake Fur, the Stay Fresh Cheese Bag, 
Nick Perks, Brett Bailey, Terry, driver of the, driver of the number 69, Crying Ryan Hand has been in a slam a jam thong Matthew M. Rice, Brandon M., Carl Brutanen and Aluski, Chimmy, Citizen High Five, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Craig Kibble, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Doesn't Tuesday It, Give Blood Fight Probert, Greach, Helm Was Held Back by Blashill, Hassam al Qasem, I'd Leave My Wife for Cider, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Kalen Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Marcus, Matt McKay, Matthew Guess, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Sean Levine, Stay Fresh Cheese Bag, Zach Spring, Sam Bankson, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Adam Now I Finish Better Than Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landiscog, Ben Barron, Brian uh, Vasha, who's a brand new name level sponsor, I think, or no, well, newer, so welcome again, Brian. Connor Leighton, Dave W., Evans, Apparently Expensive Parking Garage, Evans Bingo Card, Jack the Bassist, who I believe is a brand new name level sponsor, so welcome, Jack. Um, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, Jeremy Brocker, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, Josh Yelton, Justin in the Angry Mob, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Maximilian Cheesebags, my personal favorite patron and all-around swell guy, Reed, Papa Woody, Puck Norris, Revy DeLuca, Trevor Pevovar, Why Ryan Why, Zach McCann, a driving range superstar, and Z Grass is not always greener. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll be back with you midweek. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.